Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Praise the Lord, my soul. I invite you to declare it with me, to honor the Lord through portions of Psalm 103, proclaiming it aloud, repeating it after me, line by line. At one point in the middle, we'll pause. I'll read a section unrepeated. Then I'll, I'll signal my hand up or something like that. Um, and then we'll finish with a few more lines of repeated praise. So I invite you to stand so that we can declare it maybe a little more enthusiastically. <laughs> praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. Forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all our sin. Who forgives all our sins. Who heals all our diseases. Who heals all our diseases. Who redeems our life from the pit. Who redeems our life from the pit. Who crowns us with love and compassion. Who crowns us with love and compassion. Who satisfies our desires with good things. The Lord works righteousness and justice for the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east, East is from the West. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Again, let's declare it. Praise the Lord, you his angels. Praise the Lord, you his angels. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. Praise the Lord, all his works. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord, my soul. You may be seated. I'm fascinated by, by how, how the psalmist kind of addresses his own soul. <laughs> that that there, 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 there's, there's a need to hear, hear this, this call. How could we ever thank God enough for who he is, for all that he's done for us? Welcome to this Thanksgiving celebration. G.K. Chesterton once wrote about the great privilege of giving thanks to the Lord. He said, the worst moment for the atheist is when he's really thankful and has no one to thank. <laughs> the converse, so the, the other side of this proposition, is also true. Believers have the privilege of mixing all their thoughts with thanks. All good looks better <laughs> when they are gifts. <laughs> Let's pray. We thank you and praise you, Father, for that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Lord, your generosity reaches far beyond what we could ever repay. The beauty around us, even the air we breathe, speaks of your kindness. Lord, send your Holy Spirit with grace and power that we might worship you well today, that we might indeed give you all glory, honor, and blessing. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So I invite Nick, Nick Huber and Pauline Yancey to, to lead us in some songs of thanksgiving and praise. And then, then after that, I'm going to invite Jenny to come and lead us, lead our, our children's time. I'm sure it will be a message for the children, but, but also for all of us, too, I'm sure. And then, um, then, I'll, then Grant can, can come and share his message. Good morning. I invite you all to stand if you're able and turn to number 742. 742. When upon life's pillows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, 
count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord had done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, he would go. seem heavy you are called to bear count your many blessings every doubt will fly and you will be singing as the days go by count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see what god whether great or small do not be discouraged god is over all count your many blessings angels will attend help and comfort give you to your journey's end count your blessings name them one by one count your blessings see And number 57, number 57. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Great is 
thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Testing, testing. Okay, so there aren't like a whole lot of children here, so I'm not going to invite them to the front. Um, so don't be offended if I'm treating you like children. We're all children at heart, so we'll go with it. Yeah. Some more than others. <laughs> All right, so happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Um, I first of all just wanted to say, um, as an outgoing Sunday school superintendent, it was a joy to, um, to, to be with your grandchildren and your children and to get to know them. And uh, things were a little bit COVID-y, but um, it really was kind of awesome because we restructured Sunday school a little bit and spent a lot of time all together all of the age groups together and so I got an opportunity to get to know kids better than I would have otherwise so I'm choosing to look at the positive and to be thankful for that um, so yeah it was it, it it's a real joy for me to serve at Maple View and I really loved being a Sunday school superintendent so um, and that kind of ties into what I'm going to talk about today um, it's a season to be thankful, and this is a service where we get to share all the things that we're thankful for. Um, and being grateful can change how we look at life, and it can help change our perspective. And sometimes that's all we need, um, is just a little change in perspective. So um, I'm going to get you to raise your hand if you're thankful for the things on my list. So if you're thankful, just raise your hand. Are you thankful for your family today? Are you thankful even when a brother punches you? Nice, that's good. <laughs> Are you thankful for your home, even if it's a little drafty? Um, are you thankful for food to eat? Okay, so I'm going to get a little bit more specific. Are you thankful for pizza? Are you thankful for poutine? <laughs> are you thankful for hard-boiled eggs? Are you thankful for cooked carrots? Good. Are you thankful for asparagus? What about broccoli or Brussels sprouts? Good. I'm seeing like <clears throat> older people putting their hands up for those. Um, what about coffee? I'm thankful for coffee. Um, are you thankful for friends? What about pets? Animals bring us so much joy. And what about seasons? I don't have a favorite season, and I am so thankful I get to live in southern Ontario where we get to experience all of it. Because um, just when I can't have any more humidity, the weather changes, and it's gone like that. And we get a beautiful day like this, and fall is my favorite, but I do really love that feeling of a changing season. You know? Like, when spring comes, it starts to get a little warm. And then when summer comes, and like... You're ready for, to be hot, but then when fall comes, it's so great. And then the first snowfall is super exciting. Um, so I'm sure that you can think of lots of other things that you're thankful for. Um, and I think there'll probably be time later today to share those with all of us. Um, but are you thankful for trials and for trouble? It's not exactly things that we think about when we think about being thankful for things. Um, but in James chapter 1, verse 2, just give me a moment while I open my Bible. So James chapter 1, starting at verse 2, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you ever face trials of many kinds. 
because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So, have you ever thought about being thankful for your trials and your troubles? And here it says, consider it pure joy. So it's not saying that going through trials and troubles is joyful. It says maybe change your perspective and think differently about the trials and the trouble that you're going through. The thing is, is that growing up, I think I always thought that being a Christian was like going to be super easy. And you, when you're young and maybe you haven't experienced a lot of trials and troubles in your life, you think that that's how it is. Well, the Bible doesn't say that at all. Actually, it says that you will have trouble. You will go through trials. And Brent has been talking on First Peter and it, talking about suffering and persecution, and we're going to go through that. Um, but if we have Jesus, we can consider it pure joy because there's purpose in our pain. There's purpose in our trouble. And it develops, this verse goes on to say, it tests our faith. It develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So I don't want to stay a child. I want to grow, and I want to mature, and I want to learn, and I want to be changed. And a good way to be changed and for our faith to be tested is to go through trials and troubles. So maybe when we go from here, you can, that can help you. It doesn't mean that you're going to be happy and joyful while you're going through all the hard things, because you don't have to be fake. Um, and God knows our our emotions. He knows how we feel, but nothing that we go through, he hasn't already experienced, and he understands us. And when we get to a point through our trials and our troubles where we can maybe consider it pure joy and we can see that it's developing in us character, that's an exciting thing. So joy isn't maybe the emotion you think of when you think of trials and troubles. You maybe are more angry when you go through something difficult or you're disappointed or you're sad, and those are all emotions that we felt, I'm sure, I know I have. Um, but there's a, a changing of perspective that happens when we're going through trouble. Um, I also want to just read 1 Peter 5.10. Um, and 1 Peter 5.10 says, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So there's some really great promises in here, because first of all, it says that after you've suffered a little while, your suffering isn't going to last forever. Um, it lasts for a little while. And then there's a promise there that after that suffering Christ himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's what you get to look forward to after you've suffered a little while. And I don't know, I'm starting to think maybe some trials and troubles are good for us, and maybe we can be thankful for them if at the end of it we develop perseverance, we become strong, we become restored. What a joy that is. So I have a little um, object lesson here to kind of drive the point home. <laughs> um, so bear with me. <laughs> So it's actually a story, and maybe some of you have heard it before, um, but it has to do with carrots, eggs, and coffee. So, um, so a young woman went to her mother and told her about her life and how things were so hard for her. She did not want to know um, how she was going to make it and wanted to give up. She was tired of fighting and struggling. It seemed as one problem was solved, a new one arose. And maybe you're in a season of life where that's how it feels. Her mother took her to the kitchen, and she filled a pot with water. And then she had a carrot, an egg, and some coffee. So we know that a raw carrot is hard. If you have weak teeth like mine, they break when you eat a carrot. <laughs> and you know that an egg, I could crack this egg, and I was going to, but I'm not. Because we know what happens when we crack an egg. Is it going to... Is it hard to crack an egg? No, it's easy. It's delicate. You have to be careful. And then there's coffee, which this is ground coffee, and it, it smells delicious. 
And it's all, it's a different state than the egg and the carrot, right? These are all very different. And I wouldn't suggest um, doing what I'm going to do next and boil them in the same pot. But something happens when all of these are put into a boiling pot of water. So the mother put in the coffee, the carrot, and the egg. And she put it on her stove, and she let it sit, and it boiled for maybe 20 minutes, and she was just silent. And the daughter was probably going, what in the world is my mother trying to, to do here? Um, she let it sit and boil, and when it was all done, she turned it off, and she fished out the carrot, she fished out the egg, and the carrot, what happens to a carrot when it is boiled is it becomes soft, and it breaks easily, and it's easy for Jenny's old teeth to eat. Um, the the hard-boiled egg, so the carrot that once was hard became soft. The fragile egg, when it was boiled, became a hard-boiled egg. Trust me, this is a hard-boiled egg. It's clearly not. The shell's not coming off quite right. Another struggle we're all used to. And, and then when the coffee was finished in the water, it became coffee that you can drink. And the daughter was like, what is the point of all of this? And the mother went on to share that each of those things experienced the same struggle. They were sat in boiling water in a trial, but they all reacted differently. The carrot that was hard and, and maybe stubborn, when it faced a trial, just became soft and fell apart. The once fragile egg, um, once it was put into the trial, into the hot water, it became hard and maybe wasn't open to change or to what was new. But the coffee did something unique to that hot water, and it became a fragrant, delicious drink that you can, that you can drink, but it changed its circumstances. It changed the trouble. It changed the hot water into something good and useful. So the mother then encouraged her daughter, what are, who are you? Are you an egg? Are you a carrot? Or are you coffee? How are you going to respond to the trials and the troubles in your life? That's good. It's a good question for all of us. I'm just going to close with 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs, outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and for what is unseen is eternal. So God bless you guys. Well, thank you, Jenny. That was that was very enlightening. <laughs> I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I'm sure everyone else did as well. So, yeah, I'm going to open. Well, first off, happy Thanksgiving. And man, couldn't get a, a nicer day than this. And I know it's been said quite often when we look at the leaves this year how pretty they are. And somebody mentioned to me the other day that. That's because we had a dry year that the, someone told them that because the year was so dry that that's why the leaves are so nice. So if we're complaining about lack of crops, maybe we should just enjoy the leaves, I guess. I don't know. So anyhow, I had a reading out of the Daily Bread this morning I thought would kind of start me off on, on my little bit of a spiel I'm going to have here. Hopefully it doesn't take too long, but anyways. So it's out of the daily bread, and the scripture is out of Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7, and it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. 
The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the author that was doing this had a... It was by Alyssa Morgan, and she had a point which she said... When we focus on God and his goodness, we find that we can pray without anxiety in every situation, with thanksgiving. And giving thanks brings us a peace that uniquely guards our hearts and minds and changes the way we look at life. A heart full of gratitude nurtures a spirit of joy. And I thought that was very fitting for the thanksgiving day that we are celebrating today. And so I thought, as Sunday School Superintendent, I might, I'd go through some of the, the parts that we went through in our old, um, like last year's Sunday School book. So I kind of went through each quarter, pulled a verse out of that, and I was kind of surprised when I did how they all kind of tie together. So in the fall quarter, it was about praising God. And the verse I looked up was Psalm 150, verse 6, and it says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And I think when you... It's kind of, you look at us as people, and we breathe, and we have the ability to talk. And we can praise the Lord through what we say. And then you look at, like, how do the trees and how do animals praise the Lord? And it's, like, I think they have their own way of doing that, right? And then in the winter quarter, it was justice and law. And Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God and to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And I just thought in that verse, I thought, and now if I would put my name or if we all put our own name into where it says Israel, it, you know, it, it gives us a, a lot to do in our lives, Right? Then in the spring quarter, it talked on freedom. And John 8, 32 says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so I just thought if we tie, if you fear the Lord your God, you walk in obedience to him, and you love him, and you serve the Lord with all your heart, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So then I went into the summer quarter, which was partners in the new creation. And so I th in that one, I pulled out Revelation 21, 1 to 5. And it says here, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death nor, or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are true and faithful. And again, I apologize for being emotional up here. I'm not sure why this happens when I talk, but it does so. But 
I was just thinking on this, the, how everything ties together. And so if we, if we kind of, as I went through this, how it says, we start off praising God and we fear the Lord. If we know the truth, it'll set you free. And then at the end of our life, we will have, look what is prepared for us. So, so that was kind of just a quick summary of what kind of the, the Sunday school lessons were about last year. And so I thought I would, if I would have a title for what I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> the title would be, Do you believe? So, I come up with a word. What do you think of when I say the word comet? And so I kind of was thinking from the child's perspective, they hear the word comet, ah, that's Santa Claus's reindeer. Santa had a reindeer called Comet. I thought from the woman's perspective, Comet. Ah, that's a cleaning agent that you put in your sink. <laughs> you see the commercials where the sink's so oh, so dirty and they, they dump it in and ah, it comes out nice and clean. Uh, for those who watch the stars, I thought it's Haley's Comet comes around every once in a while. You might only see it twice in your lifetime. And then for men who are into cars, it might be the 1967 Mercury Comet. And so I was thinking, so what does this, all these things have to do with believing? So, To believe, children believe about Santa's reindeer because their parents tell them that, possibly tell them that Santa has reindeer and one of them is named Comet. So they believe it. Many of them are disappointed when they grow older and they find out that Comet there might be a reindeer called Comet, but he can't fly. Women believe that the household Comet can clean the sinks because they have seen it used and it, and it does the job. And for those who watch the stars, Haley's Comet is visible from Earth every 75 to 79 years, and it is predicted to appear in 2061, so you can, you can mark your calendars for that. <laughs> <laughs> and people believe it will happen because they've seen it. Scientists have seen it come, and it comes around, well, every 75 to 79 years. If I told you that the 1967 Mercury Comet Superstock with a 150 small block supercharged engine can do a quarter mile in 9 to 10 seconds, car enthusiasts would believe it is possible without seeing it happen because of the evidence under the hood. Now, you might wonder why I come up with all this. And my oldest son, Colin, was at Grand Bend at the racetrack. He's seen a 1967 Mercury do this. And it was pretty impressive. I'm kind of into cars. It, you know, took off, car front end lifted up, took off down the track, 10 seconds. I was impressed. 
nice looking vehicle. But I thought, you know, we have evidence in the Bible. We believe the Bible because it's been told to us by our parents. We can see how it works in other people. We can see how it works in us. Another thing that brought me to this title, um, there's a movie out, Do You Believe? And I don't know if any of you have watched this movie. But in this movie, there's a scene where the pastor of the church He's stopping at the, at the street corner. And there's a man walking up to him. He has a cross on his shoulder, and he's, the cross is on wheels. And he walks up to the pastor, and he goes, Do you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ? And the pastor, he, he said, Well, I'm a pastor. And the man goes, That's not what I asked you. He goes, do you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ? He goes, because the cross of Christ demands something of us. He said, it demands that we spread the good news of what Christ has done for us. Mark 8.34 goes like this. Jesus, it's Jesus' words, and it says, Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So, in conclusion... As surely as people believe Haley's Comet is going to make an appearance in 2061, Christ is also going to return. The time and the season we, the season we don't know. But what are we going to do with the time we have today until that happens? I want to say, like Jenny, it was, it was a blessing to be a Sunday school superintendent, even though it was a wee bit different than what everyone was used to. I kind of thought it was kind of a great opportunity when everyone got together and you had everyone's, like everyone was in the sanctuary, you kind of got everyone's viewpoints and opinions and I know that now that we're in the small class, I know discussion is a lot, a lot better, but it was, it was great seeing how people responded and, and all of that. So, yeah, it was a great opportunity for me and just glad that, I'm glad we can come together the way we are now. It's, it's awesome that we can gather not no mass and we can be comfortable around each other again so blessings to you all hope you all have a, a good thanksgiving so thank you grant and jenny for opening God's word for us, for sharing with us. Today, I am grateful for our Sunday school superintendents. I'm grateful for you, Grant and Jenny, and I'm, I'm grateful for our superintendents who are, who are serving currently. I'm also grateful for our sewing circle. Um, our sewing circle, um, you meant like, I, I think about the, mis the mission of the sewing circle and the practical ways in which 
which um, kind of those who gather so faithfully and regularly um, for comfort and nodding, for quilting, you know, are investing in God's kingdom. And, you know, those of us who, who aren't, well, I, I get the privilege of, of getting to sit in for lunch. At least I make no contribution at all. But I get a, a picture <laughs> into the, the fellowship and the, the, the you know, the, the, the godly wisdom <laughs> that, that I that, that I hear in the bits of devotionals that I've sometimes hear, but most often don't. But um, yeah, and just I just rejoice in what God does through through our sewing circle. And so our offering today is a chance for us to stand to stand with them, um, and believe that it goes toward supplies as well as helping to fund fund the, the various missions that um, that they, that they're involved with. So. Psalm 116 asks, What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. Um, So I invite the ushers to come forward and I'll lead a short prayer. Father of the heavenly lights, Thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Lord, we ask that you'd receive this offering as a token of our thanks, our love for you, our desire to join you in your mission. Lord, thank you for our sewing circle. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for those, those who serve, serve you in that way. And, um, yeah, who, who, um, yeah, join join you 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 in mission in, in such such practical ways. Lord, we dedicate this offering to you in the name of Jesus, asking that you would um, multiply it for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay. And as we give, I invite. Um, I invite Nick and Pauline to come and lead us in a song of thanksgiving and praise. And, and after that, we'll have an open mic time where, um, yeah, where there'll be an opportunity for you to s- share a testimony of thanks. Please turn in your hymnals to number four. Number four.
and number 103. Number 103. for he has made me glad. 